Foot health is the new sleep. If you touch a baby's foot when they're, when they're little, right here, it curls up like that. How come you can't do that now? This is the way we should all be walking around with a glove on our feet, not a restrictive mitten mm-hmm. with pillows underneath. Welcome to the Eat, Play, Crush podcast. I am your host, Mary Shinuda. Welcome to the Eat, Play, Crush podcast. I'm so happy to be here, Mary. I'm really happy. to. I haven't seen you in a couple years. Yeah. You look the same. Oh, thank you. You're I age, hope that, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, ageless. Yeah, you look fabulous. Uh, I want to start with how we met. Okay. Because for me, it speaks to your openness as someone who should be super busy, too busy to talk to anybody, but you always make time. So I first moved to LA and this was 2012, 2013, and I just left my corporate job and didn't know anybody here, especially anybody in the space that were in health, wellness, performance. This is before there was an Erewhon in Venice, all of that. And I cold emailed you and said, my name is Mary. I'm going by Paleo Chef, just like corporate. I'm trying to connect with people that are in the space in this area. And you with open arms, yeah, come on down. Let's have a conversation. And you sat with me. And I want to know what makes you like that. At the time, um, you know, I was trying to promote uh, this concept of primal in a paleo world. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of us in that ancestral health community were, it was very um, close knit group anyway. And so we were not about to be standoffish or exclude anybody. I certainly wanted to include everybody I could in my circle. At the time I felt like here's a um, an attractive, smart young woman who's trying to do something on her own that is impactful and meaningful within the context of what I know to be the truth about diet mm-hmm. and nutrition. So it made perfect sense to me to have just whatever we spent, hour, hour and a half, mm-hmm. shooting the breeze. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was as important for me mm-hmm. as I suspect you thought it was for you at the time. Yeah, you were super inquisitive, asked a lot of questions about what my vision was, and this is one of those things. I took my time <laughs> to, to get into the front of the housework of this right. of this space. But you're referring to a primal bl- blueprint yes. when you say that word. Yes. So that brings me to you have a, an expansive body of work, but you also speak to being kind of a, a late bloomer, like you decided to start these things at a later time. How would you introduce yourself today? Well, it's an, it's an amalgamation of uh, a career that spans 40 years, but I'm a ex- elite athlete, uh, turned health researcher, founder of Mark's Daily Apple, mm-hmm. publisher of 10, bo- author and publisher of 10 books. On 10? Diet. I thought and it was just, like five or six. 10? Well, if you include cookbooks and all the things I did before yeah. Primal Blueprint. So I wrote books. Like my first book was the Runner's World Triathlon Training Book in 1982. Whoa. So it, my, my writing goes <laughs> way back. Um, before and the then, internet. Right. Before, yeah. <laughs> Um, Tablet form. Before your parents were born, Mary. Uh, Not true, uh, (laughs) not true. (laughs) um, Also, you know, founder of uh, Primal Kitchen Foods, which was, uh, I think, a revolutionary concept in food manufacture. And then most recently, uh, found a co-founder of Paluva Footwear. Can we talk about before Primal Blueprint? When you were, it was triathlon, ultra marathon as well, or just triathlon? No, I did marathons, regular regular old marathons. <laughs> Apparently, they're still a thing. Some people still only run 26.2 miles. <laughs> Were you already dialed into what we call the primal lifestyle, or is that something you found through the oh, process yeah, no, of trying great. to like— Oh, so, yeah, So I wasn't dialed in at all. In fact, I was—my um, career path took a, a massive right turn when I retired from competition in the early 80s as a result of— not just injuries I had from overtraining, but inflammations and itises that I had from my diet. So in my pursuit of excellence and my pursuit of performance as an athlete, I went down this path of, of seeing what I could do with my diet to increase the number of miles I could run right. in a week, right? So those are the days of carbohydrate loading every day, taking in uh, mass quantities of grain-based foods because those were the considered to be the healthiest right. sources of complex carbohydrates, through my research over the following decade, I realized that the grains that I was consuming were the source of my problem. So my, my looking at um, the human body and how we can manifest a strong, lean, fit, happy, healthy, productive being, not just as an athlete, but as an as a average person, it really got deeply into the nutrition part of that. Mm-hmm. And 
the exploration and the nutrition side caused me to do an experiment where I gave up grains for 30 days, mm -hmm. thinking, yeah, I'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, this elimination diet concept mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. As soon as I gave up grains, like within 30 days, my life changed. I mean, the, the irritable bowel syndrome I'd had my whole life from the age of 14 to the age of 47 went away. Yeah. My arthritis in my uh, ankles, which had been the main reason I'd had to quit running, mm -hmm. went away. The, the uh, gastroesophageal reflux that I had after certain meals went away. Um, the, I stopped getting uh, multiple colds and mm -hmm. flu every year. Mm -hmm. um, I went years at a time without getting sick. So th to me, that was the real aha moment where I said, there's something about this paleo diet and the elimination of grains and the inclusion of healthy fats and the elimination of sugars and industrial seed oils. There's something there beyond just athletic performance. There's something there that if, if I was defending my right to eat grains because I was an athlete, in the face of all the research I've been doing about right. how antithetical grains were to health, how many tens of millions of people were suffering from right. the same sort of things that I did? You know, my gut hurts all the time. Right. I don't know why. My thinking is foggy. Um, I, you know, I have, I have GERD. I can't sleep at night. I get heartburn. I can't grip a racket, tennis racket or a golf club because I got this little arthritis in my fingers. It must be because of my age. There, it can't be anything to do with my diet. Right. I mean, all the assumptions that people right. have about how how bad life must be as you age. Mm -hmm. And I'm there going, wait a minute. Like, like you can not only stop the digression of this, you can improve for the next few decades if you figure out these hidden genetic switches that we all have and ways in which to turn on the ones that build muscle and improve the immune system and get rid of arthritis and turn off those genetic switches that cause you to be gaining weight or to be in pain all the time because of inflammation or to, or to just be puffy because of the water retention or to have um, uh, leaky gut syndrome that then manifests as autoimmune diseases. Right, right. So, when I rediscovered the excitement about the possibility of the human body, if you get if you get some of these behaviors right, right. It, it literally energized me for the next several decades. Right. The things that I like, the examples that you gave is you had a need and a necessity as an athlete. But the examples you gave are examples that are relatable to anyone who is or isn't an athlete. It also speaks to your ability to want to test on yourself, to prove yourself right or wrong. And then it also speaks to your natural innate a curiosity to make your body function better, which will lead to the most recent endeavor. Mm -hmm. Were you a career athlete and you weren't doing, like, did you have a job? <laughs> or was your job being an athlete? No, no, no. So this was, um, this was back in the days before most uh, non-league athletes got paid. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, a runner and one of the top ones in the country for uh, a bunch of years. And then I became a triathlete. Um, and so I would get paid to go to a race. I wouldn't get paid. I'd get a ticket to go to a race and I'd get, I'd get put up in a hotel. But you were not allowed to accept prize money mm -hmm. in those types of events because of the um, what they call the amateur rules, the mm -hmm. AAU, the American Amateur Union, Athletics Union. Um, uh, Where were sponsored Instagram posts back then? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, you couldn't do that. You would get you would get disqualified from um, many races, and you would maybe get disbarred from or barred from competition mm -hmm. in any of the championships as a result of accepting prize money. Mm -hmm. That changed in the uh, mid to late '80s, but before that, it was difficult to make a living yeah. as an endurance athlete, despite the fact that it was probably the most challenging and hard task of all the sports to get out there and, you know, grind it away every single day and run 10, 15, 20 miles a day incessantly, just managing discomfort the whole time mm -hmm. for no pay. Like, right. why, like why did I do that? So, <laughs> um, but, you know. Thankfully you did because that thank, leads yeah. to where you are now. So the other part of me is I'm an entrepreneur and yes. I've always been entrepreneurial. So I started a lawn mowing business when I was 12. So I was working 40 hours a week in the summer mowing lawns for different homes around the neighborhood. How much did that make back then? Um, that was $2.50 an hour. So that was 100 bucks a week, which was a ton of money mm -hmm. for an early teen yeah. to, to be making. Then I, in the wintertime, I grew up in Maine, so I, I would shovel snow. I'd, I, I made Christmas wreaths uh, and sold those door to door. 
Um, I would love to see a Christmas wreath that you yeah, made. Christmas is around the corner. Old, old wire coat hangers. You use that as a frame. And we had tons of fir trees, you know, green, green yeah. trees. Anyway, it was it was amazing times. And the, just the feeling of of creating something and making a sale based on that, which I know you've experienced. Mm-hmm. And when I was like 15, I learned, I got a job briefly painting houses for, for, for a contractor one summer. And I just said to myself, I could, I could do this. So I started painting houses and mm-hmm. I started making a lot of money. There was, there was one year, my first year of college, I made more money in the summer than my dad made all year at his job. So I was quite successful as a painting contractor, largely because of my athletic mm-hmm. skills. So I could monkey up and down a ladder and paint the outside of a house, generally myself, before another company could come in and put up the scaffolding so that the five guys working on it could you know, loaf around and take <laughs> lunch breaks all day. Uh, Have you seen The Money Pit? Uh, a long Tom time Hanks, ago. Yeah, Michelle, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he's like, stroke, slowly, <laughs> don't tickle, yeah, yeah, and yeah. don't smoke. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. But so, so I got, and again, I got in a competition with myself. How much yeah. money can I make? Yeah. How hard can I work during the week? How quickly can I get this job done so that I can go home and run 15 miles? So I supported my running habit mm-hmm. as, a, as a painting contractor. Uh, so for years after I got, and I was in, I was pre-med in college. I mean, I, I got a degree in biology. I was pre-med. I was always going to go to med school. And then some, some. You're such a stud. Some things. Always been. Something switched <laughs> off in me, like my senior year of college. And I just, I lost interest in, in that amount of dedication and work to go to a school and spend eight more years to get a degree in something I might not really enjoy. So one of the best decisions I ever made was to not go to med school. But then I painted houses uh, for a number of years. I, I started, I had a painting contracting business in Palo Alto in 1981. I started a frozen yogurt shop. So I was I was one of the first people into the frozen yogurt business. In Palo Alto? In Palo Alto, yeah. Bay Area, what up? Yeah, yeah, right <laughs> off the of University <laughs> Avenue on Amazing. Emerson. Amazing. Yeah, uh, it was called Cool Licks. Cool Licks, it was f- spectacular. So my, my partner in that and I, it was... It was wildly successful, but then we got, I, was, I wouldn't say greedy, but we decided we were going to build a, a large uh, emporium, a restaurant that included frozen yogurt, sort of Mrs. Fields type cookies, a mm-hmm. uh, salad bar, a uh, soup bar. And uh, this was, in, um, by then it was um, 1983 or four. And this is before we were, the grain free we life. Were, <laughs> we were lucky, we were lucky to borrow money at 17 and a half percent in those days and just crushed us. So- Back to zero, started over again. Yeah, you know, moved to LA to to uh, become an actor. Really, was that? Well, some... I wanted to become a sportscaster. So, but in order to do that, you have to sort of get into the yeah. into the machine with an agent and take acting classes and do yeah. all that. So, I got my SAG card on uh, Dynasty, but I just didn't like acting, so moved on to the next thing. Yeah. So, my life has been about pivoting. Yeah, but all the while I was supporting myself, even in those years, as uh, painting houses. Yeah, I th- I wanted to highlight and exemplify the fact that you are someone who's worked incredibly hard, and you are not afraid to roll up your sleeves, and you do reinvent yourself. And it's people might see the success now and the trips now, but it's it's earned yeah. and earned in a way that I don't think a lot of people want to sign up for. Right? They want that they want the success to happen right away, and they don't want to put in the work, or they want to outsource every piece of the work and don't realize the the level of dedication it takes to to get somewhere. I get it. I mean, apparently I'm not using chat GPT correctly to build my own website in 10 minutes and start making twenty twenty two thousand dollars a month <laughs> selling shit on Amazon. You would do circles around. <laughs> they should build a chat GPT on you. Like yeah. we should create a, yeah. an algorithm questioning series yeah. based on the questions that you ask. I would just have a chat with you every day. <laughs> like, okay, what do I do next of my life? Yeah. <laughs> so you come to LA, you have this history of success and figuring things out, what was the moment or the, the period of time that got you to begin with the Primal Blueprint? And how did you identify what products and what information you were going to put out? Right. So in the early 90s, I came to LA. I got married. I had uh, a wife and two kids. And I had a job that was paying me enough to live on and support the family, but not enough to be feeling like I was confident that I had a secure future. Mm -hmm. So um, I was designing supplements for a company. So I left that company to start my own supplement company. And my interest had always been in sports performance. I'd written books on training. I wrote the 
Runner's World Triathlon Training Book in 1982. I wrote uh, Training in Racing Duathlons uh, in 1989. So I'd, this sports performance interest that I'd had continued. And, and then I got interested in, um, uh, in the Olympic anti-doping movement. So mm-hmm. I wanted to create supplements that athletes could take mm-hmm. to enhance their performance and recovery without violating mm-hmm. uh, the guidelines. So that begat my supplement company. Early on, very quickly, I learned that athletes don't want to spend money on supplements. They want to be sponsored. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I shifted to, uh, to selling to people who are interested in anti-aging. So as far back as 1997, 98, I was selling my supplements as anti-aging supplements. Mm-hmm. And I built a nice market on that. And I built a nice business uh, largely on the strength of my appearing on television shows, little cobbled together TV health talk shows mm-hmm. that I'd go on. I'd, I'd talk about all manner of diet and exercise and, and you know, how you can improve your life through these, these little things. Oh, by the way, over here, I had these supplements that might help you. Mm-hmm. So a nice little, it was a nice model. This was before the internet and, and, and when the internet came on and it came on strong around 2004, that model dried up the the TV part of that stopped working, um, as did the call this 800 number now and mm-hmm. place your order mm-hmm. now. People could go online. So I pivoted to uh, starting a blog in 2006, mm-hmm. Mark's Daily Apple. And that was my opportunity to create content because I was pretty good at creating content in terms of my vast not just knowledge, but my willingness to opine, my willingness to to give um, you know interpretations of of the scientific literature. Mm-hmm. Um, You're to, elite at that to um, this day, one of the best. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I I just feel like it's the it's a lot of the missing link between where medicine is at this you know ivory tower and mm-hmm. and the average person just wanting to do the right thing but having no idea. Well, you make it make sense. Like you're not so clinical that you like fall asleep or feel lost or afraid to ask a question because you sound so smart that if I ask a question, I'll be dumb. And you're not so simplified that it's not like the top five. Like you, you take the complex science and you make it make sense for anybody in the room. You could say it seven different ways. And make sure that every person understands it. And I've said way. it seventy different ways. Yeah. I mean, that's the <laughs> that's the nature of what I've done. Between the, um, the so to that point, the blog, which was Mark's daily Apple, was posting something every day, and usually anywhere from twelve hundred to four thousand words. A very in depth analysis of a study or or some insights that I'd had. Um, after about two years of doing that, I started getting people asking, "Can you write a book? Like we love the blog, but can you put it together in a form that?" that uh, has a, bi- a beginning, a middle, and an end and makes you know, sense in the context of everything we're trying to do. So I wrote The Primal Blueprint, and that came out in 2010. Based on the following that I had at the time and my having learned how to leverage the platform that I had and, and a few other opportunities, it actually went to number one on Amazon of all books in the world uh, for a day. And uh, that was that was cool. And then got knocked off by um, the Big Short, Michael Lewis's uh, book, which you know made total sense because it was a huge book. Then I started on that path of like, okay, books are going to be something that I can use to leverage this mission that I had. I wanted to change the lives of ten million people. I wanted to be able to affect the lives of ten million people, not just with food and 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 diet and nutrition, but with other lifestyle things. How much sun do you get? Sun exposure, sleep, play. All these things that uh, kind of make up, you know, uh, a whole total life. Mm-hmm. I was still selling my supplements, and that was using the blog as a platform to sell right. my supplements. But about a few years in, I started to realize um, I'm writing about whole food. I'm writing about uh, naturalness of living as uh, an an- in an ancestral template, and that supplements didn't kind of fit into that. It was a little bit of a, a disconnect there, a little bit of a cognitive dissonance. So I, I started thinking, well, you know, I, I write every Friday, I put out a recipe about how to make your own ketchup, how right. to make your own right. salad dressing, your own mayonnaise. Why don't I start actually creating a product line mm-hmm. that fits all the criteria that that I would want in a product that I would buy off the shelf? Mm-hmm. Because I, I had been, it had been years since I'd bought mayonnaise off the shelf. It had been years since I'd bought any sort of salad dressing. Uh, so we set about to uh, create this company called Primal Kitchen, mm-hmm. and the first product that we were 
really luckily, the first product we were able to commercialize was the mayonnaise. Right. And I didn't know at the time because I thought mayonnaise, like it can't be that big. Like ketchup has to be twice as big as Mm -hmm. mayonnaise. It's not. Mayonnaise is more Mm -hmm. than twice as big as ketchup. So it opened the door for um, a company to be producing a product that was demonstrably the best of its kind in that category. Like if you go down the list of all the ingredients, what's in it, what's not in it, how does it taste? I had a number of um, mentors in the food business say, big mistake, you don't want to do this. Right. You don't want to make an expensive mayonnaise. That category is already overrun. And you certainly don't want to start with one product. You want to introduce a suite of products, like eight salad dressings maybe. So that first year, and, such bad and, 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 and you were there. I mean, you know, we we Yeah, launched. my little flex of I did contribute to a couple of formulas That's of your, the product line. Yes, for sure, for sure. I appreciate that. <laughs> the first year, we had like two flavors of mayonnaise, mm-hmm. one salad dressing, and two collagen bars. Mm-hmm. So we're in three different aisles in the store, which is counter to every piece of advice we'd ever gotten. Mm-hmm. And we started to take off. And we got noticed early on by by Whole Foods, mm-hmm. uh, which normally takes two years before you can even get a foot in the door. Because of the success we had early on at Whole Foods, we got into the conventional marketplace. We got into Publix, right. which is a large uh, Southeast chain, very early on. So the the Primal Kitchen uh, food company grew very quickly and, uh, you know, was just a, such a, a wild ride. Somebody just reminded me, in an email today, it's coming up on five years since we sold it right. to Kraft Heinz. Right. And so you guys had it for five or six years before you sold it or we, less than that? Less than that. We we literally sold the first product in March of 2015. And we had a firm deal five years ago today of, uh, you know, of 2020, uh, sorry, uh, 2018. Yeah. And we closed in early first week of 2019. What's it like... When you have begin to have those types of conversations, negotiation conversations, like what does that feel like? Does it is it exciting? Is there a little bit of like I'm letting it go? And then when the deal closes, is it excitement, relief? Like because having a business like that, yeah, you do things differently. You're measured. You're methodical. You have a strong foundation. For someone, it might be relief because of that massive overhead and responsibility, and you know better than anyone else. Manufacturing has disasters that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight. And you seem to to manage that well. I've I've had conversations with Morgan where she's like, "Oh, guess what happened with <laughs> with this lot?" And I'm yes. like, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah. So no, when you anything, have those- anything that can you know can go wrong, you know there was we had a two trucks full of mayonnaise, two giant forty eight foot trucks crossing the Rocky Mountains to deliver to um, Whole Foods uh, one winter in the middle of winter. Yeah. And the truckers you know parked the trucks and and went and slept in a motel overnight. And it got so cold, the mayonnaise broke. It froze. I had an issue with the Rockies, too, with one of my products. <laughs> Two full truckloads gone, completely destroyed. And so what we had to do as a result of that, which is really funny, we had to deliver in the wintertime, we had to deliver in refrigerated trucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Is that crazy? <laughs> For the three and a half years we did this, uh, I had a $10 million line of credit that I was the personal guarantor on. If anything went wrong, everything I'd built up to that point in my own life Mm -hmm. was on the table for going out to pay off creditors or whatever. I didn't like that. I hated that. But you did it. I did it because that's (laughs) what you do. Right. You know? So there are a lot of these issues that I don't think people, you know, fully comprehend as as an entrepreneur what you get into when you start, when you sign up and say, yes, I want to be an entrepreneur. Sure, that sounds like fun. Right. I always Um, say don't. Yeah. A lot of of ups and downs. Do you Um, love your life? Do you like joy? Yeah. (laughs) Look, there are incredible highs. And, yes. and so, you know, getting an offer, we had three offers uh, when we sold uh, Primal Kitchen. And uh, they were, you know, they were life-changing offers. Like, I don't need to do anything for the rest of my life. I, I'm, I'm set. This was incredible. And yet, when we picked the uh, Kraft Heinz as the, as the final choice, and we, and I'm, I'm like forever grateful that we did because they've been an amazing partner. They've maintained the integrity Everything of Everything about the it. Products. They just said, hey, you know, we bought you for what you are. We don't want to change anything. Mm-hmm. We want to learn from you. We want to mm-hmm. watch you grow. We want to help you grow. We want to give you resources. We're not going to change your team. So they've been spectacular uh, in that regard. But prior to the close, prior to coming up with the actual deal, uh, there was six weeks of intense negotiation back and forth and threats to not do the deal. 
you know, there's a lot going on under the surface that you don't see and a lot of st stress and tension. And I mean, I talked with a founder yesterday who's going through the same thing right now. And he just said, oh my God, I threatened to shut the deal down yesterday. I can't believe that happened to you. <laughs> yeah, it happens to, to everybody, you know. I've never actually seen you demonstrate uh, or emote stress. I've actually never seen you emote anything other than <laughs> just baseline. Stop. I've never seen you emote. <laughs> Which is what my wife says sometimes. But, <laughs> but no, yeah. it's it's one of the things I admire about most of the people in my life that I work alongside or look up to or my athletes or the coaches I'm around is we have big feelings, but we know how to manage them and deliver it in a way that still allows things to move forward. So as you're going through those negotiations and there's these big threats are happening, how do you personally manage the underlying emotions or stress? Or do you feel stress? I mean, I know you said oh $10 million dollars on the line is a lot. No, no, but no. Like, Oh, my God. I mean, that's the through line of my life. If you ask my wife, does Mark feel stressed? She's like, well, we almost got divorced several times mm -hmm. because of the stress that Mark felt. And, you know, we were able to negotiate that and get our way through it. But if the fact that I don't show it doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. And... Part of my training, as I alluded to earlier, so my life as an endurance athlete was based around managing discomfort. Mm -hmm. Now, managing discomfort that was that was uh, that I put upon myself. So, how much, not pain, but how much discomfort, how much suffering am I willing to undergo today in this training run, where I'm going to go 15 miles and I'm going to do six minute miles for the first 10, and then I'm going to drop it down to whatever. It's a conscious decision to dig a pain cave, to dig a hole for yourself every time you go out and train. And then when you go to a race, now you're lined up against 20 other guys who have done the same amount of training, the same amount of, of management of discomfort. And now it comes down to who that day is really willing to just dig a huge hole for themselves, drag everyone else into it with them, and then spit people out on the back and hope mm -hmm. that they win. Mm -hmm. It's a perverse kind of way to think about sports and, and, and games and... Or it's an honest and, and, way to think about it. Well, but it's it's the closest to a survival, you know, mode that, that you can put yourself in. Now, in terms of business, so I've learned how to manage discomfort. So I, I know it's not going to kill me. I know I'm going to get past this. I mean, one of my favorite lines of all time is this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. And I have to invoke that mantra. That gets me through a lot. Yeah, quite often. Yeah. Um, and then when it does pass, you go, what was I so stressed about, you know. I'm waiting and, to get there. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, but there were times when I wouldn't sleep at night. Yeah. You know, and I just, I was awake, just tossing and turning and stressed and worried. And and then my wife, who's very good at this, she said, first of all, recognize that there's nothing you can do while you're sleeping. So either get up and fix it mm -hmm. or put it out of your mind. And how you put it out of your mind is you literally take that thought, you lie on your side and you envision that thought dripping out of your ear onto the pillow. I love that. I love that. So... <laughs> So this is connected, and it'll lead to your choice to to start another business. What is it like to to attempt to accomplish everything that you're accomplishing while you're doing it? A lot on the line, a lot of dedication, and still managing to find a partner and have kids and raise a family. Because I had Mark Groves on the podcast, and I framed that conversation around What's the advice for, for people who are looking for partnership and family when they're high achievers? You've got athletes on the road. You've got high-powered executives. You've got these people where there's a purpose that tends to be prioritized a little bit more than what other people prioritize when it comes to the goal is family and kids. Yeah. With you, that's not just it. So if you can speak to what that is like and the balance with that and the the luck or blessing to have met a beautiful, supportive wife and have these badass kids. Yeah. You know, I, again, it goes maybe back to my own childhood. My parents got divorced when I was a teenager. I didn't want to put, I have three siblings, uh, that sort of really messed their lives up. Where are you in the- I'm the oldest. So I was actually gone. I was already away at school when I was 15. So I didn't, I wasn't around mm -hmm. the turmoil, but I didn't want to put anybody through what I'd gone through or what I'd seen my siblings go through. So I was very clear that when I had a family, I wanted to uh, spend time with the kids, spend as much quality time with my wife as I could. Mm -hmm. I work out of the house. So I never really went to an office and, mm -hmm. and escaped for, you know, 16 hours a day as some entrepreneurs brag about doing. I was sort of always in, in the back room at, of the house so I could say hi to the kids. I could I could take a break and go uh, coach Little League or ref soccer or attend a soccer practice or go to a game. So I was really 
quite involved in my kids' lives the whole time. And now that they're 32 and 29, they're like, that's the most important thing you could have done was the time. It mm -hmm. wasn't the stuff. It mm -hmm. wasn't the, even the trips to Disney or whatever, you know, it was just the time, like mm -hmm. teaching them how to boogie board, you know, at Zuma Beach, you know, or teaching them how to snowboard in, in Aspen or um, at Mammoth or, you know, these little moments mm -hmm. that, that you never get back. So I recognized very early on that the only reason I wanted to make a lot of money was security. Why do you want security? So, well, so I can take care of my family. Well, if you can't take care of family now, and security, that in that word security means making your family feel secure in your love and support of them in real time as they're growing up, then it's, then it's kind of a, uh, a mismatch with somebody who says, yeah, I want to make a lot of money so I can take care of my family one day. Just it makes no sense to me to do that. So uh, my primary advice to any entrepreneur who has a, a relationship or has a family is do not sacrifice your family or your current living today for something that might happen and might be successful in five or 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's really key. You have that security. You sold a company. You could just ride off into the sunset. But no, <laughs> because a piece of you while you say it's yeah. for security. Yeah you also are purpose-driven. Yeah. So did you take any time off or did you immediately start I mean, no, <laughs> building I, I, this out? I, I pretty much, I, I tell people I try to be retired for a year or so, but even in that time, I was plotting this, this next move. Okay. I, there was a lot of groundwork that went into my starting Paluva, which had to do with research, had to do with legal research and, and R&D and things like that. So where where did the the initial passion or curiosity for footwear like this begin? Because similar to when you're talking about diet is necessity, need, opportunity, self experimentation. Right. Is that the similar format totally. with this? Uh, everything I've ever built or created was for me first, and then I'll let other people <laughs> use them if they want. Love it. You know. Um, again, the, the vitamins, the supplements, they were for me. For I wanted the most powerful, high potency antioxidant multivitamin I could come up with. Um, I wanted food that I could use with reckless abandon <laughs> on my on my salads or on my steaks. Facials well, with, with mayonnaise and that, well, conditioner with mayonnaise. I see your ridiculous tweets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so with regard to uh, footwear, you know, I, as a former runner, I my feet were my my weapon. They were my tool. They were what I used I, to to go faster. And I was never satisfied with the shoes that I had, even the so called high tech early Nike, you know, waffle trainers and all of that stuff. Um, and I suspect one of the reasons I got injured was because of the, the, the cushioning that they had. In my teens, when I started running, I had been running in Chuck Taylors, basically low-rise yeah, yeah, sneakers, yeah. thin low-rise sneakers, which are now apparently a, a fashion statement. <laughs> um, and then Tiger on it, on Onitsuka Tigers, which were a very thin, thin racing flat. And that's all we had to run in. So it was your feet that told you when it was time to stop running. Uh, your feet, your and your maybe your Achilles and your calf, because you had to you had to land on on the ball of your foot. You had to run appropriately. You couldn't heel strike because the shoes were not they were not set up to do that. You'd, right. you'd quit running after after fifty yards if you heel struck that way. So if you run properly and you use your calves and your Achilles and the bottoms of your feet the way they're supposed to, you can't do 120 miles a week in in those shoes. So along comes Nike and and and, he, and Phil Knight and and Bill Bowerman. They make these thick shoes so that the elite runners could run far more miles. And I was one of them, but I suffered other injuries as a result. I just bypassed that and went up to my I got achondromalacia. I sat out a season with bad knees um, because of the way the shoes were built. But did you know because of the shoes were built then, or um, you're just like, what's happening? Uh, you, I didn't know at the time, but right. I, do, I know exactly now what was happening because mm -hmm. there's so much uh, research gone into this in, in the interim. And then I never liked street shoes. Like I never liked narrow, leather, pointy, fashionable, Italian style kind of stuff. Um, and even the campus casuals, even the the Nikes, the Adidas, the Pumas, the, the Avias, the any other of the st standard shoes, I just didn't feel comfortable. It felt like my feet were being squished. Even if you buy a wide, you know, a double E or a triple E shoe, they still come together at the point of the toe. And so, yeah, you're the, the mid part of your foot, the metatarsal area, it's wide enough to accommodate that, but then it ruins everything by jamming the toes back together again. So in 2007, 2008, I was an early adopter of these minimalist shoes that were on the marketplace, and particularly these five-toed shoes. 
Uh, I remember the first time I saw a pair, they were in the bathroom of somebody I was dating when they were being hung. He would do altar running. And it's the first time I'm seeing them. I'm in there. I'm like, hmm. I don't know what to make of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they turn they turn a lot of a lot. I mean, of these are off. much yeah, nicer yeah, yeah, than the yeah. ones back then. Oh, but, for sure. That's but, the, that's, but he, that's the point. There was a, a cult following of that, and it obviously has has a lot of science behind it, which you you right. So I was an early adopter, and I was a, a big proponent. I, I had twenty five pair in my closet. That's all I wore for like twelve years. I had different versions. I had a I probably showed up at your. At, at a meeting with you wearing um, black leather versions of them, but they still were. I've never seen you in regular shoes, I don't yeah, think. Ever. <laughs> yeah, So, you know, the, I think the concept was amazing, was great. The execution was flawed. So, you know, I tried to convince them to make some changes. They wouldn't. And so I got sidetracked by building a food company uh, for a bunch of years. And then I would say, as soon as I sold Primal Kitchen, I'm like, okay, now I'm going to really attack this problem. I want to, I want to redesign footwear from the ground up, literally from the ground up, uh, in a way that optimizes foot performance. And our three things are, we, we, we say comfort meets function meets style. So they have to be the most comfortable shoes you've ever put on. Check, yeah. as I have them on. Um, they have to be functional, which means they have to have art individually, individually articulating toes. You have to feel the ground underneath and your toes have to move independently every time you step on a root or a, or a rock or a change in, in terrain. Your feet should adapt and adjust to that and then send a signal to your brain exactly how to bend the knee, how to flex the ankle, how to torque the hip. And modern shoes don't do that. The thick, foamy, cushiony shoes might feel great when you're walking down the aisle of the running shoe store as you try them on. But I think they're antithetical to foot health in so many ways, not just the cushioning aspect and not just the elimination of this, of this haptic input that we need from the bottoms of our feet but just from the squishing the toes together and cutting off the circulation to the feet and from the artificial arch support, which then unburdens the arch of having to do any work. So people say, well, you know, I can't, I can't wear your shoes, Mark, because I have flat feet or I have bad arches. We have bad arches because you haven't been working the small muscles of your feet for 30 years or 40 years. And you have bunions because you've been scrunching your big toes together. You have plantar fasciitis because you've cut off the circulation to that area in the foot, all in the name of fashion. Mm -hmm. And then again, perversely, all in the name of foot comfort. Like you're mm -hmm. wearing these so-called comfortable shoes that are not doing anything for you. It's like identifying a serious problem, a serious medical problem, and then taking a drug to mask the symptoms. Right. Or putting a Band-Aid solution on something that needs to be right. sewn up, you know. Right. So, so you're uh, going down the path of, of trying to sort this out. Are you are you sketching what you like want it to look like? Are you calling yeah. people to come in and help you with this? Oh are my you God! No, did I, you sew the first prototype yeah, together? <laughs> that would have been me in the old days when I was I was designing clothing, my own clothing when I was in my early twenties. Of course, you were. I, I, I had some amazing clothing that I designed. <laughs> that um, is that how the line's going to expand? And that's and that's ba back in the uh, days of of. of uh, what they call new wave music, mm -hmm. you know, Devo and those things. So you can oh, imagine what man. I was doing. Can I please yeah, get yeah. some pictures of some, this? Of, some of my some, some of my plastic jumpsuits for going out clubbing. Anyway, I digress. Um, no, because of where I was in my entrepreneurial career and my wanting to be, you know, completely resolute in getting the best possible product, I hired some of the best people in the world who mm -hmm. design shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, my COO has been what we call a shoe dog for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just been going into running shoe stores to, we're, we're starting to sell in some running shoe stores. Every salesperson is yours. Oh my God, that's Ike. I, you know, Which I, shoe stores are you guys in? We're in two right now, um, fit to run and go and go run Miami, two in my backyard in Miami yeah. so that I can be, literally be there yeah. and go in and, and Because again, you will roll up your sleeves and be there and, and, and you're, yeah. out here we're talking about the brand tirelessly. You're also, I just want to point out, you've done a lot, you've accomplished a lot, you've had successful businesses, you've had businesses that weren't successful. Your ratio, though, of picking good COOs is, again, some of the best I've seen. You know what's funny? Thank you. Um, the one before Morgan was horrible. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I fired him mm -hmm. just so I could hire Morgan. She's also elite. Yes, one no, of one. No, no, it's uh one of one for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's the best single best hire in my career. Yeah, yeah. So back to the shoes. Yeah. I have a professional shoe designer who uh, lives next to our manufacturer. Who you know is co it's constantly coming up with new designs, new iterations. Mm -hmm. uh, we had 
this particular shoe, this is called the Strand. This is our, our trainer, our lightweight trainer. Yeah. Um, the first model that we produced almost two and a half years ago, um, I wear tested for a year. I put 650 miles training on that one pair yeah. in Europe two years ago, um, going up cobble streets, hiking on pavement for 10 miles at a time with yeah. no yeah. bone bruising, no discomfort. Yeah. You, you self-test. I can't remember what product it was, speaking to how you wore this yourself. Morgan said there was a time that you like exclusively ate one of the products consecutively for a certain number of days because you were so concerned, like you want to stress test yeah, it. Yeah. So on brand, how many how many iterations of the design did you go through before you picked the one that went to market? Well, so we have several on the market now. So we've had um, you know 20 iterations uh, over uh, four different styles. Mm -hmm. So we have the Strand, which is the trainer, mm -hmm. uh, which is what you're wearing. Um, I'm wearing uh, our leather, uh, high-quality Napa leather lace-up. So this is more of a work shoe. This is something I would wear in, in the workplace or going out to dinner or going out to a club. Mm -hmm. um, you still go to clubs? I'm in Miami. I have to. <laughs> it's part of my job. It's part of my job. Um, I have to You be say seen. like you hate it. Okay, come yeah, yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this uh, one near you, the white one, that's a, that's a, yeah, sort of I a like, loafer. Yeah, I like the, the vibe of this right. quite and a that, bit. Right, again, that's called the Miami. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine, you know, wearing Bermuda shorts or something like that and, and a Aloha shirt or something. That's a, that's the, that's the Miami. Like from so this we, angle, they look like Vince's. I, I like how you've mimicked some of the, yeah, so the stylistic to that, things. To that point, you know, that looks like a real shoe from the outside, and it is a real shoe, but it's only 1.2 centimeters thick at the mm -hmm. heel. So it's a minimalist shoe. It feels when you right. walk over, uh, you know, uh, You can see the textures. shadowing. I don't know if the yeah. catch on camera, but yeah. the shadowing of where it actually drops down. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so we, we've wear tested these before we even started putting them out, seeding influencers, for instance. And the influencers that we have on board now are just – Absolutely loving the shoe. I mean, these are mostly, for now, fitness and health people because that's who we really, really want. We have three uh, podiatrists who are on our board of advisors who are taking a, a look at everything that we produce and vetting them for biomechanics and mm -hmm. functionality and, and all of the things that we want these shoes to do in terms of the functional part of it. Mm -hmm. So I'll speak to my first experience with them. So I tried one on on my right foot, and it very quickly – showed me how poorly my foot has adapted to shoe life, like regular shoe life. But the, the, used, it, it hasn't poorly adapted. It's perfectly adapted to okay. the shoes yes. that, you've, that you've been wearing, which <laughs> yes. is not good for your foot health. Fair point. Because yeah. I used to always be barefoot. I would play barefoot as a kid. I would train barefoot. I would play tennis barefoot before I would do matches my practice because I, I liked the, the sensation of feeling things underneath there and it would help with my ankle and my knee. And then I went into corporate America and went into the, the suit and briefcase and heels and all of that. And it'd be a bummer to see my foot just like this at the end. And I don't play competitive tennis anymore. So there was less of, of that. And I would just wear Metcons, Nikes, Freeze, et cetera. So putting these on, I couldn't get my big toe wanted to go this way. My <laughs> my little toe was like curling in. So it didn't wasn't frustrating. It was like, okay, I can't, I'm excited to get it to to adjust. And the the not discomfort, but the foreign feeling lasted a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And it was like my foot came home. It was like, this is great. And then I a couple of my athletes were playing. So I was watching the game and got distracted and then realized I was wearing the shoe and it felt so, so comfortable. Right. So it was it was really cool, and then I got up, you know, like did a little fit check. <laughs> and there's an element to it where I made the joke. I'm like, so these feel like chastity shoes for me. <laughs> and but I want to train in them. I want to run in them, and then I want to work towards experimenting with it being in the social scene. I want to speak to you're one cool cat, Mark. Oh my god, thank you. And so why you? Why are you going to make this acceptable, cool, pushing a movement? Well, I would say, um, and not not lightly, if not me, then who? And the reason is, um, this has been tried before and and was immensely successful until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't for a handful of reasons that were like a perfect storm of bad things happening. So um, I think the time is right now. There's been a real resurgence in interest in foot health. I, we say foot health is the new sleep, 
right? How sleep has been the focus for the last five years. Nobody's been paying attention to foot health. It's your, it's your connection with earth. It's your connection with everything. If you spend any amount of time on your feet, you want your feet to be smiling. You want them to be healthy and happy, not groaning in pain because you've worn shoes that are causing discomfort by themselves or that you've ruined your feet through years of uh, misaligned, misshapen, misengineered shoes. So my, my approach to this is, this is a gift I want to give the world. I mean, I literally think this is the way we should all be walking around with a, with a glove on our feet, not a, a, n- not a restrictive mitten mm-hmm. with pillows underneath. Mm-hmm. Um, Could you imagine that that's what? No, uh, right? No, feet Why are just is the like logic hands. Any different? No, that they, you know, they both have you know five digits on each one. Uh, they they articulate. They can manipulate. If you touch a baby's foot when they're when they're little, right here, it curls up like that. It, how come you can't do that now? I mean, you should be able to. Our feet are so important to us. Now, I'm I'm the recently because I turned seventy. I'm the longevity guy too. Well, if you can't be mobile in this world. If you are unable to walk and enjoy the sunshine outside or walk along the beach or walk on a hike or get on a plane and go to another country and and spend three hours walking around uh, museums, that's a huge quality of life compromise that you're making in not being able to do that. So why would you not want to optimize your foot health? Mm -hmm. So when the original minimalist footwear movement really took off was with um, Chris McDougall's book, Born to Run. Mm-hmm. I love and that book. It was a great book. And Chris is a great guy. And, he, and, and you know, it was a great thesis about you're born to run, but you're born to run appropriately and you're born to run barefoot. Well, because we live in a society that we've created where there's concrete and pavement and glass and hardwood floors and marble and tile and everything else, it's, it's just inappropriate to go barefoot on those surfaces. We did not evolve to go barefoot on those surfaces. Mm-hmm. We evolved to go barefoot on hard-packed earth, mm-hmm. on grass, tamped down grass, on wooded trails. So I wanted to create a shoe that was like, they gave you the feeling of walking barefoot on a putting green, right? That's the sense I want to give people. So why me? Um, I have the means now. So I don't need to be raising this money and take a, sh- you know, take a shot at it. I have the luxury of having my son as a co-founder of being able to hire some of the best people in the world to design the shoes and to help me bring them to market in a way that educates. Look, if you go back to our original meeting, I'm an educator. You said that. I mean, I, I spend my life apparently creating really complex products that, that once you understand what they're about, you go, oh my God, how come no one did this before? Mm-hmm. You don't take the easy route. At all, ever. No, but, you know, it... it, it <laughs> Which speaks to it, why you, right? It's yeah. because this is not easy. This is not it's a quick a, this hit. This is a totally an educational sell. Mm-hmm. And if you give me 10 minutes with anybody, one-to-one, I can sell the shoes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, can I do it in a 30-second Instagram piece or a, you know, a quick TikTok video? Louder. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see. Speaking to people that are in the space that we're in, it's it's a, an easier conversation and we sort of know what to expect because we're more tapped into our bodies. If somebody is being introduced to this for not the first time, but like, oh yeah, I've seen those toe shoes before, what can they expect when they're wearing it the first day, the first week, like physically, yeah, what can they yeah. expect? And because someone might feel pain and think it's bad versus yeah. understanding that it's your body like readjusting and finding its way again. Right. In, in the last um, several years, 20 30, 40 million toe spacers have been sold. So I think women in particular are getting this notion that you gotta, you got to spread the toes out again. You have to get this toe splay in order to improve your foot health. Not just splay, but now you have to be able to articulate the toes up and down. So if, if you're someone who's been using the, the prior iteration of this type of shoe, uh, the first thing you'll notice is these are much more comfortable. You can walk. In the old ones, 10 years ago, I, I would started walking a lot and I, and I couldn't do more than two or three miles without mm-hmm. getting a bone bruise right. from the pavement or the concrete or whatever. So we put a little bit of cushion in this, not a lot, but just enough so that I can walk 10, 12, 14 miles some days in Europe in these. And every step feels like, again, I'm walking barefoot on a putting green. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a whole different sensation. Now it's not so cushioned that you lose the sensation of what's underfoot. You feel everything you're stepping on. So if you step on a small pebble, you feel it, but it doesn't feel bad. It feels great. I choose like moonscape surfaces to walk and run on. 
and and dart between you know on riprap on the shore of a, a lake or something like that, looking for these. I want every time my foot lands it, to, to have it land in a different position with the ankle bent one way, the yeah. ankle bent another. And every time I do that, I'm literally strengthening my feet. So I feel like this is something that we're that the time is right. So timing is also everything in business, right? If I'd started Primal Kitchen 10 years earlier than I did, it would have failed because nobody knew about healthy fats or they, there was not enough awareness of it. Now people are starting because of the toe spacer movement because you see a lot of, I mean, even Chanel is making their sh their shoes wider. Mm -hmm. They still come to a point in the front, but they're but they're recognizing comfort is an important. I know a part. Chanel collaboration. I I wouldn't mind a couple <laughs> Chanel C's on here. <laughs> yeah. Well, my wife spends enough there that maybe I can make that. Happen. So I have a, a question about what I'm wearing. So I, I mentioned to you that wearing this made me realize the the toe. So. For me, I thought it was all tennis players because we talk about this, that our big toe tends to jut Rise upwards. Up, yeah. yeah. Yep. And this shoe right now, and the recommendation is to go half a size up, which we did. And so my toe is is slightly risen. And then my baby toe is curled down. Can I expect over time yeah. wearing these shoes for it to find its, its pattern again? Absolutely. Well, because of uh, the nature of most uh, traditional, tip typical running shoes now, um, what we call sneakers or trainers, the toe does come up. They call it toe spring. And they build it in for some reason that they think is a good reason uh, so that when you roll off the toe, um, you know, you get some extra propulsion if you're running. But that's really not the best for your foot health. Your toes should be all touching the ground at the same time. So if you spend enough time in a shoe that has this upturned toe, and then if, if my thumb were the big big toe, you know, you not only you scrunched it against the other toes, but now you've turned it up. Mm -hmm. So you've cut the circulation off in the entire plantar fascia region. Mm -hmm. And so people who sometimes suffer from plantar fasciitis don't really have an itis. They don't really have an inflammation. It's, it's, it's an osis. It's a death of tissue from lack of circulation. You want the big toe to abduct. That's pulling away from the other toes. That's the splay we're talking about. And if all the time you spend in shoes, they're scrunched together. You lose that circulation. And over time, mm -hmm. if you cut the circulation off to anything, I mean, if I sleep on my, on my shoulder wrong at night and my, my hand gets numb because I've cut the circulation off. Well, imagine if you did that eight hours a day for 30 years, mm -hmm. the problems with that. And then even more so, if you, if you scrunch them into a running shoe and now you're trying to, the foot wants to be, whenever you run, the foot wants to be splayed, like if you've ever run barefoot on the beach mm -hmm. at, at low tide, mm -hmm. it's an amazing, wonderful feeling. And if you if you sprint, you see that the toes all spread out. Right. And then the, the big toe it's pushes off the most. It, it's the deepest one. Well, now if you get in regular running shoes and you and you and you not only restrict the outward movement, but also the individual articulation and, and have the big toe sort of beholden to whatever else happens with the other toes, mm -hmm. you lose all of that amazing propulsion, all of that. Um, strength giving, health giving, uh, movement and, and articulation that the foot wants to do, but you've prevented it from doing for so long. So it's no wonder that at any point in time, 25% of anyone who claims to be a runner, 25% of all runners are injured at any point in time. And then, you know, virtually every runner gets injured at some point in their running career. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to argue that it's largely a, a result of their choice of footwear mm -hmm. and their... And, and it gets complicated. I'm writing a book on this. Um, it's, go figure, I'm writing another book. <laughs> um, it comes down to partly the fact that because the shoes that they're choosing are so cushioned in the heel mm -hmm. that it encourages heel striking, mm -hmm. which is, again, the wrong way to run. You should not be heel striking when you run. I'm just thinking about the mechanics of movement for all my athletes across multiple sports. And I'm I'm in my mind thinking, is there a place for them to be training in these shoes? And then how does that translate to when they're on the field, on the pitch, on the court, when they're unfortunately not going to be wearing shoes like this, they're going to be wearing shoes that yeah, cater to the- Yeah, specific shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think this is, this is probably one of the greatest demonstrable applications of this. I've got, I already have- top guys, I can't name names because they sure. bought the shoes, um, <laughs> but who are training uh, in their in their training yeah. regimen, football players, 
uh, who are doing stuff on the track or in right. the gym with Paluvas on. Uh, I've got um, NBA guys training with these, scrimmaging with these yeah. in the gym. And then, of course, yeah. you, you can't, you know, when you're scrimmaging and you've got control over this. Also, if you haven't, like if you've seen LeBron James' feet, pictures of it, they're the ugliest feet in the world. No offense, LeBron. LeBron and, sorry. And that and Usain Bolt. And I mean, they're like, how do you even walk, let alone perform what you do? They're all scrunched together mm -hmm. with, with misshapen toes. Like this is one of the tools you use to hopefully to continue your career as long as you can. And if it gets messed up because of injuries. Right. I'm thinking about injury pre prevention, recovery, pain, pain management right. after heavy loads on the court or on the pitch. Right. But so, you know they're doing the like they roll the lacrosse ball out right yeah. on the on the well you don't need to do that if you spend your whole day training your arch and walking around and doing all your errands and going to the gym and doing everything else you do except your mm -hmm. sport mm -hmm. wearing this type of footwear mm -hmm. where it 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 strength we call it passive conditioning it passively conditions your feet you don't know it you don't feel it you don't you, there's no stress going on it's not like you're doing dynamic ballistic stuff you're just walking and and all the the whole time you're 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 increasing circulation to the foot you're spreading the toes out you're articulating the toes up and down um, and that's over a period of weeks or months that's going to have more benefit than any of these sort of sports specific physical therapy rehab exercises mm -hmm. that guys are doing. And it's, like you said, happening when you're not even thinking about it. Correct. You're just doing that. Yeah. So for the non-athlete, for the average person who's, you know, toe shoe curious, yeah. <laughs> would you want them just to start with using these during training or is it training and you're at home? So someone who's like, I'm going to still wear my heels to oh, dinner. Oh, don't stop wearing the heels. Yeah. I mean, only because I'm um, I'm that shallow, but uh, you know if we're gonna make if we're gonna make any sort of life prescription here, this is about enjoying your life. So if enjoying your life includes going dressing up and going out to dinner and having a great time, I don't want to stop you from doing that. But like a lot of people buy these and say I'm gonna wear this when I walk my dog in the morning. That's a start, mm -hmm. you know. And and I'm I'm gonna test the waters. It's 5:30. It's dark, so people won't see me, <laughs> you know. But but then I've got um, my you know Carrie, my wife has. We have 15 of her girlfriends who only wear Paluvas now. Um, even when they're out shopping in their Lulus, they get matching black, you know, black versions of these with black Lulus or whatever. We get pink ones. Um, and they look actually cute. They, yeah. they, it's not like they don't look good. They actually look cute. People will say, oh, my God, they're so cute. Where'd you get those? Mm -hmm. Right? So you have to kind of be able to own it. Mm -hmm. And then understanding that you're doing this primarily for the Comfort first, and then foot health almost second. Comfort is like number one on this. Um, foot health follows as a result of the. And they are of time. comfortable. Like yeah. I, anyone that knows me knows I. Yeah. Suffer no fools and yeah. don't waste my words. So if I <laughs> right, say it's right. good, it's good. If I right. say it tastes terrible, it tastes terrible. <laughs> right. So they are comfortable. I am already curious about for me what it's going to do to my ankle health because I have ankles that come in just a little bit, and then I have an issue with one knee and an issue with my back. I've two extra vertebrae that twists in a certain direction. So I'm curious over the course of a few months what I will cha notice change there. So I'd have you do, um, for starters, a mile or two mile off road on, on a trail that's uneven mm -hmm. and just play around with it. And look, if you're uh, if it's a concern, bring a backpack and bring your regular shoes with you. And if you say this is I'm a mile out and it's whatever, uncomfortable, go for it. But um, I think in something like that where you want, you, you again, you want the foot to go through as many ranges of motion as it can. When you wear a stiff boot with a high, a high stiff ankle mm -hmm. and a thick sole underneath, you're just clomping, clomping the same, you know, this, through the same range of motion the whole time. And then if you step on a rock this big sideways, you almost risk twisting an ankle because of the leverage of how high you up. If you step on that same rock barefoot, your brain would go, oh, I, 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 know how to, I know how to absorb the shock of this. I might have to, you know, bend it a little bit. I mean, we like, we like to talk about, like, imagine if you were to walk across a carpet strewn with Legos in the dark mm. at night, you know, your brain would tell you mm -hmm. exactly how, by the time you weighted that front foot, mm -hmm. you'd know exactly how to, how to it do it. It wasn't Legos, but it was the plug to my flat iron this morning. Okay. I went to go to the restroom yeah. and I, I'm, I I'd like to pay attention to my steps and I came down and I, I kind of chuckled to myself in my half sleep. I'm like, look at you being so aware. That could have been way worse. <laughs> But th that's the awareness that we get, that we cede control over mm -hmm. to these stiff, cushioned, 
shoes, Mm -hmm. right? And if we can get that awareness back, it has a complete kinetic chain result to it. You know, your kinetic chain starts with the contact with the earth. Mm -hmm. So we can get these online? Yeah, these are at uh, paluva.com, P-E-L-U-V-A. Dot com. How do you come up with a name? It's a made-up name, and in Portuguese, P, P is foot, and luva is glove. So <laughs> that's that's how the name came up, yeah. <laughs> how long did it take to come up with that? A long time, because I, I tried to... Um, <laughs> we, we, what we, are some of the failed names? Oh, Anisi, uh, A-N-I-S-I, which is Greek for um, comfort. Mm-hmm. Um, we had some... Um, we, we actually hired a a consulting agency, a branding agency to come up with uh, a name. And they spent six weeks and a lot of money to tell us uh, we actually like Paluva better than anything we came up with. <laughs> I guess if that's a form of validation. Yeah, and, you, you know, paid the price for yeah, that. Correct. Do you want to give your uh, listeners a, a, a discount? Yeah, I didn't want to presume okay. that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So anyone that wants to get their hands on this, can yeah, you so offer Yeah, so if they them? come through your site, yeah. through your recommendation, let's do a 15% off and let's call it Crush 15. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. How many podcasts have you done recently? I feel like you're making the rounds. I'm making the rounds, yeah. Any question that somebody asks that you love that question and you want more people to hear the answer to that question? <sighs> I mean, I don't want to discourage anyone from being an entrepreneur. Right. So when we talk about the ups and the downs and how the downs are really down, you know, and this notion that um, we have to somehow, A, we have to be uh, a millionaire by the time we're 25 and a billionaire by the time we're 30, that's not real world stuff. And so the Instagram has done nothing but sort of crush people's dreams because they've, they've, come to expect that short attention span. Like I wor- I worked for three weeks on this and it didn't, it didn't happen. Right. You know, I tell my kids, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up until I was 47 mm-hmm. and it's okay to, to, to make lots of pivots in your life. Mm-hmm. I did, but it's also not okay to not have a plan for today. Mm-hmm. Right. You, you need to sort of wake up with something that, that, that makes you want to get out of bed and get started with the day. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the message I want to leave with all the budding entrepreneurs out there is, is yeah. if you really believe in yourself and what you're doing uh, and you keep working away at chipping away at it, being open to not just criticism, but open to new opportunities, mm-hmm. you will one day find your way to um, wealth. And that whether that wealth is money or whether it's a family that loves you and, mm-hmm. you know, kids that appreciate the time you spent, um, you know, just stay the course. Mm-hmm. You're the epitome of eat, play, crush, always have been. Mm-hmm. Are you still active on social where people can find you in this upcoming book? Oh, and yeah. This? Well, the upcoming <laughs> book isn't out yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll be doing another series of podcasts when it okay. comes up because it's going be, to be an amazing book, maybe my best ever. Um, I'm on um, uh, Instagram as Mark Sisson Primal. I'm not good about posting new stuff there. I should, but when I you should. do, <laughs> it's cold. There's enough shirtless <laughs> shots of me to go around for a couple of years anyway. But of course, Mark's Daily Apple is mm-hmm. the blog still to this day, something up every day. Mm-hmm. We're now over 17 years uh, posting. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. And then Primal Kitchen is retail everywhere. If anyone, right, I'd right. be so shocked if someone hasn't heard of Primal Kitchen at this yeah, point. Yeah. It's, that's really gratifying to say, oh, you're that guy. Your face is in my refrigerator. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah. So then on Instagram for the shoes, it's wear Paluva, W E A R Paluva. Great. Great. Thank you so much for the time. It's always great seeing you. Thank you, Mary. It's great to see you. And that is it on today's episode. Thanks so much for hanging out. Your time and attention never goes unappreciated. If anything in today's show stood out to you, I encourage you to share it to social and tag me. That is how you can help a little independent show like mine grow. And of course, rate, review, and subscribe to Eat, Play, Crush wherever it is you get your podcasts. If you want to follow me, I'm at Paleo Chef on social media or the show at Eat, Play, Crush. If you want to stay in touch via my newsletter or get your hands on the gut reset, visit eatplaycrush.com. And until next time, be well, do good, and trust your gut.